Exodus chapter 29. We'll be starting in verse 42. And if you would, please stand for the reading of God's word this morning. Again, Exodus 29, verse 42. It shall be a regular burnt offering throughout your generations at the entrance of the tent of meeting before the Lord, where I will meet with you to speak to you there. There I will meet with the people of Israel and it shall be sanctified by my glory. I will consecrate the tent of meeting and the altar. Aaron also and his sons I will consecrate to serve me as priest. I will dwell among the people of Israel and will be their God. And they shall know that I am the Lord, their God, who brought them out of the land of Egypt, that I might dwell among them. I am the Lord, their God. Let's pray. Dear God, our Father, our, our Lord, Lord, once again we come uh, humbly, Lord, before uh, this portion of Scripture, Lord, as we are learning more and more of your plan with the tabernacle and how you were pointing Israel forward to your son, to the gospel, Lord. God, I pray this morning as we go through this portion of Scripture, as we go through this chapter, Lord, we learn not only about the priests and their ordination and how they were set apart to do a holy task, Lord, that we also learn about our calling, that you have given us a task, Lord, that we are to proclaim your glory, your goodness, your grace, the gospel, Lord, here on this earth, Lord. God, be with us this morning, Lord. I pray that we are encouraged and challenged through this portion of scripture. In your son's name, amen. You may be seated. We are continuing our sermon series through the, the tabernacle. If you're new this morning, we've been in Exodus chapter 25, now through chapter 28 for some weeks now, learning about the tabernacle, this place where God has set up to dwell in the midst of his people Israel that he's in covenant relationship with. Today, we're going to be looking at Exodus 29, and I want to walk through the majority of the chapter. It's a long chapter, so we're going to skip over a couple parts and, and through, but we're going to get the whole uh, gist of what's going on in this uh, chapter. And, and this chapter is about the ordination of the priest. You know, last week we looked at the, the high priest's holy garments and uh, what the high priest was to wear as he uh, performed his duties uh, around the tabernacle and, and within the tabernacle. Today we're going to look at the ordination of the entire priesthood. Aaron and not just Aaron as a high priest, but also his sons. So there's two things I'd like to do this morning as we uh, go through this text. The first thing I'd like to do is just look at the text itself, kind of just walk through it verse by verse, and, and we're going to see as we walk through this text, Exodus 29, verse by verse, that there was five parts to this ordination, uh, this process of setting apart the priest for this task that they had. There, there's five parts, and we're going to look at each part, each part of the ordination. Uh, then from there, the second part of the sermon this morning, I want to look at the application of this text for us, uh, for us as New Testament believers. How, how does this apply to us? How does this uh, uh, t speak to us? What does it teach us? As New Testament believers. And so that's the uh, two parts of the sermon this morning. So let's just jump right into it. Let's start with the text itself. Again, this is the ordination or the consecration, the setting apart of the priest in the Old Testament. And there's really five parts to this ordination, and each part is extremely important. Uh, the five parts are these, the choosing, the washing, the clothing, the anointing, and the atoning. Again, the choosing, the washing, the clothing, the anointing, and the atoning. So let's walk through these five parts. Uh, let's go verse by verse through this passage. Again, if you would look at verse 1, Exodus chapter 29, verse 1, if you would read along with me, it says this. Now, this is what you shall do to them to consecrate them. That means to set them apart, set them apart as holy, to consecrate them, 
that they may serve me as priests. Take one bull of the herd and two rams without blemish and unleavened bread and unleavened cakes mixed with oil and unleavened wafers smeared with oil. You shall make them a fine wheat flour. You shall put them in one basket and bring them in the basket and bring the bull and the two rams. These are the materials that are going to be used for this ordination. Unleavened bread, uh, cakes and wafers, all mixed with oil, but most importantly, one bull and two rams. One bull and two rams without blemish, symbolizing perfection. One bull, two rams. Now look at verse 4. You shall bring Aaron and his sons to the entrance of the tent of meeting. Now, Again, there's five parts to this ordination. The first part is the choosing. God chose Aaron and his sons to be priests. It was a calling. There's no indication in the book of Exodus that Aaron inspired to to be a priest, to become a priest. There's no indication that, that Aaron sought after the priesthood for him and his sons. No, instead, just like Moses... God called Aaron to this task. And this is really true for for every priest in the Old Testament. Most priests were born into the priesthood. It wasn't a career move. It wasn't a a college choice that they made to become priests. They were chosen to become priests. Just think of the tribe of Levi itself. The Pentateuch, they were chosen for this task as a, a tribe. To be a tribe of priests. And What's interesting about that is that they are a very unlikely choice. In fact, at the end of Genesis, Jacob, right, Israel, the father of the, the 12 sons that become the 12 tribes of Israel, he had some really harsh words about two of his sons, Simeon and Levi. He cursed them because of their anger and violence. Yet God still chose Levi. The priests would come from the tribe of Levi. And not only that, God chose Aaron and his sons. Again, men who weren't inspiring to be priests, they were chosen for this task. God told Moses in verse 4, bring Aaron and his sons to the tabernacle, to the tent of meetings, meeting to be ordained. So really the first step of this ordination was the choosing, the choosing of Aaron and his sons. The second step of this ordination was washing. Again, look at verse 4. It says this, You shall bring Aaron and his sons to the entrance of the tent of meeting and wash them with water. Now, we're not sure if the whole body, Aaron and his sons, their whole body were, were washed or if it was just their hands and feet. But either way, the symbolism is the same. They were dirty and they needed to be cleansed. Remember, in the Old Testament, uncleanness, sinfulness, and death were all related. Those things are all related. Therefore, for Aaron and his sons to become priests, they needed to be made clean and holy. To symbolize the washing away of sin and iniquity, they were made clean. But this also symbolized something else that I think is very important, and I, and I hope we don't miss. Uh, before any p- other part of this ordination could happen, they were washed, meaning they brought nothing to this calling. I mean, think about it. All they brought was nakedness. They had nothing to offer within themselves. They were naked, dirty, needed to be cleaned and clothed. Which brings us to the third part of the ordination of the priest. Aaron and his sons were clothed. They were clothed. Look at verse 5. It says this, You shall take the garments. Now these are the specific garments that were talked about in Exodus 28. The holy garments. The garments of the high priest that we spent a whole sermon on last week. You You shall take the garments and put on Aaron the coat and the robe of the ephod and the ephod and the breast piece and gird him with the skillfully woven band of the ephod, and you shall set the turban on his head and put the holy crown on the turban. Again, this crown with the words engraved in it, holy to the Lord. Again, this is the high priest, holy, glorious, 
beautiful garments. And it wasn't just the, the high priest. Aaron's other sons, right, the other priests, were clothed as well. There's a distinction between Aaron and, and his, uh, the other priests. The, the high priests wore a particular set of clothing that we talked about last week, but the other priests were clothed as well. Skip down to verse 8. It says this, You shall bring his, that's Aaron, his sons, and put coats on them. This means even the average priest, not just the high priest, even the average priest was clothed. Their, their nakedness was covered, just like, just like Aaron's nakedness was covered with the beautiful garments. Just like, as we learned last week, Adam's nakedness was covered with the garments of skin. Look at verse 9. And you shall gird Aaron and his sons with sash- sashes and bind caps on them. And the priesthood shall be theirs by a statue forever. Thus you shall ordain Aaron and his sons. This was an important part of this ordination process. Clothing the priests. Covering uh, the nakedness after they've been washed with these clothes for the task that has been given to them. The fourth part of the ordination is the anointing. Look at verse 7 now. Verse 7 says this. You shall take the anointing oil and pour it on his head and anoint him. Now, this is talking specifically about Aaron as the high priest. Moses was to anoint Aaron by pouring out oil on his head. Again, as I just said, there's a clear distinction between the high priest and just the average priest. Only Aaron was anointed this way where, where the oil was poured out on his head. In fact, listen to Leviticus 21 verse 10. It says this, The priest who is chief among his brothers, that's the high priest, who, on whose head the anointing oil is poured and who has been consecrated to wear the garments. That's the holy garments of Exodus 28. But again, even the average priest was anointed. Look at verse 21. Exodus 29, verse 21 says this. Then you shall take part of the blood that is on the altar and part of the anointing oil and sprinkle it on Aaron and his garments and on his sons and his sons' garments with him. He and his garments shall be holy and his sons and his sons' garments with him. Again, just like everything else, this was an important part of this ordination, the the anointing with oil, which showed that God's power, that God's favor, that God's presence was connected to the one being anointed for a particular task. In this case, the priest and, and their work within the tabernacle. In fact, there's a connection in the Old Testament with anointing with oil the anointing of oil, and the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. In fact, there's a a number of places in the Old Testament that we see these two things somewhat connected. Let me just give you one example. This is 1 Samuel 16, verse 13. It says this, Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him. This is David. And anointed him in the midst of his brothers, and the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day for it. Again, there's a connection in the Old Testament with the anointing and anointing with oil and the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. So I don't know if the priests were empowered by the Holy Spirit to do the particular task within the tabernacle. It doesn't, doesn't specifically say that, but they were anointed with oil, meaning that they were empowered by God for this task. They were given what was needed to accomplish the task as priests. This brings us to the Fifth and most important part of this ordination, Aaron and his sons' sins being atoned for. Now, this is clearly the most important part when you read through this chapter because it takes up the most space in this chapter. You you learn uh, through Scripture that one of the ways the author emphasizes how important something is, is is by writing a lot about it. So if you get to a place where something is talked about a lot, that's probably the author trying to tell you that this is important. 
And it's the case here, verses 10 through 37 describe three different sacrifices right, that, that remind us that the sins of the priests were atoned for through sacrifice. Now remember verse 1, the materials that were used for his ordination. Verse 1 says this, Now this is what you shall do to them to consecrate them, that, that they may serve me as priests, Take one bull from the, of the herd and two rams without blemish. Again, let me say it. One bull, two rams without blemish, representing perfection. Three animals for three sacrifices that will be made in this ordination. The first sacrifice is a sin offering. The second sacrifice is a burnt offering. And the third sacrifice is a fellowship or peace offering. Offering. Now, we've talked about these different offerings a, a couple of times, so this should be familiar with us. But let's look at these three offerings that are, were done during the ordination. The first one is a sin offering. This, this was the offering, the sacrifice that atoned for the priest's sins. Look at verse 10. Then you shall bring the bull before the tent of meeting. Aaron and his son shall lay their hands on the head of the bull. Again, lay their hands. This was to identify with the bull. The bull would be a substitute, identifying with the worshiper, or in this case, the priest. Right? The bull is going to take the place of the, the priest who laid their hands on this bull. Right? We'll look at verse 11. Then you shall kill the bull before the Lord at the entrance of the tent of meeting, and shall take part of the blood of the bull and put it on the horns of the altar with your finger, and the rest of the blood you shall pour out at the base of the altar, and you shall take all the fat that covers the entrails and, and the long lobe of the liver and the two kidneys with the fat that is on them and, and burn them on the altar. Listen to verse 14. But the flesh of the bull and its skin and its dung you shall burn with fire outside the camp. It is a sin offering. The bull was a substitute. It was a substitute that atoned for the sins of the priests. It was a, a, a substitutionary atonement, this doctrine that, that this bull was a substitute for the, the priest and took the punishment that the priest deserved as he was slaughtered and burned on the altar. This brings us to the next offering, the the burnt offering. Look at verse 15. Then you shall take one of the rams. Again, remember there is two rams, one bull, two rams. Verse 15. Then you shall take one of the rams, and Aaron and his son shall lay their hands on the head of the ram. Once again, this is identifying with the ram. Verse 16. And you shall kill the ram, and shall take its blood and throw it against the side of the altar. Then you shall cut the ram into pieces, and wash its entrails and its Legs and put them with its pieces and its head. And listen, verse 18. And burn the whole ram on the altar. Again, this was a burnt offering. This is sometimes called the whole burnt offering because the whole animal was burned on the altar. Now, the word burn is extremely important. In Hebrew, the word burn means something like turn into smoke. It doesn't just mean burn. It means to turn into smoke or transform. That's a good word for this. Transform into smoke. Meaning, you didn't just burn the the animal on the altar. You actually were transforming the animal into smoke. So look at verse 18 again with that idea, that connotation in your mind. Verse 18 says, and burn, or, or again, transform, right? And burn the whole ram on the altar, It is a burnt offering to the Lord. It is a pleasing aroma, a food offering to the Lord. So this animal was transformed into smoke, and that smoke would ascend into heaven and become a pleasing aroma to the Lord. Therefore, this um, offering had less to do with atonement. All these offerings have to do with atonement, but this one has less to do with atonement and more to do with complete submission to God that the whole life of the worshiper, like the animal, the whole life belong to the Lord, dedicated to the Lord as a pleasing aroma as it ascends up 
to heaven. This brings us to the last offering, the fellowship offering or the peace offer, offering. Look at verse 19. You shall take the other ram. Again, two rams. This is the other one. You shall take the other ram, and Aaron and his sons shall lay their hands on the head of the ram, and you shall kill the ram and take part of its blood and put it on the tips of the ear of Aaron and on the tips of the right eye of his sons and on the thumbs of their right hands and on the great toes of their right feet and throw the rest of the blood against the side of the altar. Now, for us New Testament believers, it sounds very weird right, to take some of the blood and put it on the, the ear, the eye, the thumb, and the toe. But if you think about it for a second, all this is saying and symbolizing is that the whole person from head to toe belongs to the Lord. This is dedicated to serving God as the priest of Israel. Now, verse 21 through 30, verses 21 through 30, uh, explain how this offering was to be made. There's specific uh, details in this offering. It was a fellowship offering, but it was specific to this ordination. Uh, they did certain things that were, were only for orda- ordaining a, a priest in Israel. But the main point of a fellowship offering is simply fellowship. At this point, the priest has been washed. Don't you think about it. The priest has been washed. He's been clothed. He's been anointed. And his sins have been atoned for through the sin offering. Therefore, he is at peace with God. This is why this offering is sometimes called the peace offering. He's at peace with God and welcome to fellowship with him. So skip down to verse 31. Verse 31 says this, You shall take the ram of ordination and boil its flesh in a holy place, and Aaron and his son shall eat the flesh of the ram and the bread that's in the basket in the entrance of the tent of meetings, that's the tabernacle. In other words, they are eating at the entrance of the tabernacle, the dwelling place of God, his house. Meaning they are at peace with God, and not only that, they are in fellowship with God. This is very similar to the 70 elders in Exodus 24 who went halfway up the mountain and ate with God. In fact, Exodus 24, 11 says this, they beheld God and ate and drank. Listen, as New Testament believers, we, we often have a negative connotation when it comes to, to, to priests and the priesthood of the Old Testament. I think there's a couple of reasons for that. One mostly probably because of the New Testament Gospels and, and the corruption that we see within the priesthood. But I want to be really clear. In the Old Testament, it was a privilege to be a priest. They got to enter the tent. They got to see the beauty inside the tent and draw near to the presence of God. They got to serve God with with their whole lives. They got to fellowship with God. They beheld God and ate and drank. This was a privilege to be a priest. It was a privilege. Look at verse 33. They shall eat those things with which atonement was made at their ordination and consecration but an outsider shall not eat of them because they are holy. Only the priest could eat. And if any of the flesh for the ordination or of the bread remained until the morning, they shall burn the remainder with fire. It shall not be eaten because it is holy. For the ordination, only the priests were allowed to sit at the table and, and fellowship and eat with the Lord. And this really is how the ordination ended. Fellowship with God, eating a meal in his presence, ended with them at the Lord's table eating. Now, the ordination wasn't a a quick thing, and we went through this passage really quickly. 
It actually lasted for seven days. And not exactly sure what was repeated each day. It's not extremely clear on that. We, we know one thing that was repeated as I'm about to read, but this, this took a whole week for this ordination to take place. Look at uh, verse 35. It says this, Thus you shall do to Aaron and to his sons, according to all that I have commanded you, through seven days shall you ordain them, and every day you shall offer a bull as a sin offering for atonement. Also you shall purify the altar when you make atonement for it and shall anoint it to consecrate it. Seven days you shall make atonement for the altar and consecrate it, and the altar shall be most holy. Whoever touches the altar shall become holy. So I just want you to think about that for a second. This this took seven days, seven days for this ordination to happen. Meaning, Seven days of reflection and heart preparation as the priests were getting ready to take on this holy task. Every day there was a sin offering. We know that much. Meaning day after day, bull after bull, the priest was confronted with their sin and the grace of God atoning for their sin through a sacrifice. Seven days of reflection for this important task, seven days of reflection, knowing that they are going to serve the living, holy God. This brings us to the last part of our passage this morning. Now that we have seen the instructions given to Moses for the tabernacle, Exodus 25 through 27, now now that Moses has told us about the priests and that they are to be ordained for a special task and that they, they are intimately connected to the tabernacle, and that's Exodus 28 through 29, we get somewhat of a a climax here. We, we, we still have a couple chapters to go before we're done with this portion of Scripture, but, but God tells Moses the duties of the, the priests and their purpose. Look at verse 38. Now this is what you shall offer on the altar. Two lambs a year old, day by day regularly. One lamb you shall offer in the morning, and the other lamb you shall offer at twilight. And with the first lamb, a tenth a measure of fine flour mingled with a fourth of a hen of beaten oil and a fourth of a hen of wine for a drink offering. The other lamb you shall offer at twilight and shall offer with it a grain offering and its drink offering as in the morning for a pleasing aroma, a food offering to the Lord. Verse 42. It shall be a regular burnt offering throughout your generation at the entrance of the tent of meeting before the Lord where I will meet with you to speak to you there. There. There I will meet with the people of Israel. And it shall be sanctified by my glory. I will consecrate the tent of meeting and the altar. Aaron also and his sons I will consecrate to serve me as priest. I will dwell among the people of Israel. I will be their God, and they shall know that I am the Lord. That's capital L-O-R-D, meaning Yahweh. I am Yahweh, their God, who brought them out of the land of Egypt, that I might dwell among them. I am Yahweh, their God. Verses 43 to 45 really brings us back to the thesis of the book of Exodus, the the main point of the book of Exodus, and, and that's God making his name known. I am Yahweh. I am the Lord. This is the purpose of the priesthood. This is the purpose of the tabernacle. The glory of God. The tabernacle reveals who God is, as we've seen over the last few weeks. It it reveals the name of God. Again, verse 46, And they shall know that I am Yahweh, their God. Now, I want you to think about this. Where would the tabernacle end up? Think big picture scripture. Where does the tabernacle end up? In the promised land eventually, right? Forty years of wandering, but eventually Israel crosses the Jordan and gets into the promised land in Jerusalem. Meaning, and and eventually the tabernacle will will become the temple, meaning at the center of the temple, the center of the tabernacle was the 
Holy of Holies, the throne room of God. The center of Jerusalem was the temple. The center of Israel was Jerusalem. And where was Israel located? The center of the world. Surrounded by the nations. The promised land was strategically placed by God right in the middle of the nations. Just look at any map this uh, today, any map of the world, right? World map. What's right at the center of it? Israel. Just about every world map has Israel right at the center of it. Think about this. Israel was a nation and is a nation today that, that's smaller than the state of California, yet it touches three different continents. Not nations, not countries, three different continents. Europe, Asia, Africa. Just think about the people groups that are represented by those three continents. Israel is at the crossroads of the world, of the nations. And the tabernacle, which becomes a temple, is right in the middle of it. The purpose of the tabernacle uh, and the priesthood was to make God's name known to the nations. This is why Jesus was so angry in the Gospels with the corruption of the temple, the corruption of the priest. Listen to Mark 11, verse 15. And they came to Jerusalem, and, and he, this is Jesus, he entered the temple, and he began to drive out those who sold and, and those who bought in the temple. He drove them out, and, and he overturned tables of the money changers. I mean, you just don't see Jesus as passionately angry in the Gospels very often. But he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons, and he would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. And he was teaching them and saying to them, Is it not written? I mean, he's quoting the Old Testament here. Is it not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for what? All the nations. but you have made it a den of robbers. Listen, the priesthood, the tabernacle, the temple was all meant to reflect God's glory, to reveal God's glory, to reveal his name to the nations. Look at verse 44 again. Exodus 29, verse 44. It says this, I will consecrate the tent of meeting and the altar. Aaron also and his sons I will uh, consecrate to serve me as priest. I will dwell among the people of Israel and they will be, and will be their God and they shall know, shall know that I am Yahweh their God who brought them out of the land of Egypt that I might dwell among them. I am Yahweh their God. This leads me to the application this morning. Again, the question I want to answer this next part of the sermon is, how does this apply to us? You read through Exodus, and it seems like such an obscure passage. How does the ordination of the priests relate to us? Again, we just think that's Old Testament stuff. How does it relate to us as New Testament believers? Here's how. We have been given the same exact calling. I want you to think about this for a second. Up to this point, as we've walked through the tabernacle, like everything points forward to who? To Christ, right? Just over and over again, God, God is teaching his people that there is a Messiah that's going to come. He's pointing them forward to Christ. But then we get to Exodus chapter 28, and guess what it points forward to? It points forward to us, to our calling. Think about the ordination of the priests. Five parts. The choosing, the washing, the clothing, the anointing, the atoning. You know what that is? Our salvation. That's us. We were chosen. First Peter 2 9 says, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood. A holy nation, a people for his own possession that you may proclaim the excellence of him. 
proclaim his name, proclaim his character, proclaim his glory, who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. John 15, 16, you do not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you. Just like the priest, just like Aaron, he didn't, he didn't choose this calling. God chose us and called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. Ephesians 1, 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us, chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will. We were chosen. And we were chosen for a purpose. To proclaim the glory of God to a lost world. And just like the tribe of Levi, we were an unlikely choice. James 2, 5, listen, my beloved brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom? 1 Corinthians 1.26 For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were, were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose. He chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. He chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. He chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing the things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. God chose us. We didn't earn this calling. We didn't seek this calling. It was by God's grace that we were given this calling. And not only did he chose us, but after choosing us, he then washed us. Just like the priests were washed. Titus 3, 5. He saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and the renewal of the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 5.25, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he, this is Christ, that he might sanctify her, that's the church, that's us, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. Hebrews 10.22, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Just like Aaron and his sons, God washed away our uncleanness. He washed away our imperfections. He washed away our iniquities. He, he washed away our sins, but, but he didn't just leave us naked. Our sins are washed away, but, but that puts us at zero, and we have to be holy to get into the presence of God. He also clothed us. Galatians 3.27 For as many of you were, as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Not only did God wash away our sins, but he also covered our nakedness with the righteousness of Christ. He placed Christ's righteousness on us, just like the high priest, with his crown that declared him holy to the Lord. But it doesn't end there. Because not only did God choose us, not only did he wash away our filth and sin, not only did he clothe us with the righteousness of Christ, but he also anointed us with his spirit. He gave us what we needed to serve him for the task that he has given us. Acts 1.8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and to the ends of the earth. What's that? The nations. 
Titus 3, 4, again, but when the goodness and loving kindness of, of God, our Savior, appeared, he saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. Listen to this. Whom he poured out on us richly through Christ Jesus, our Savior. Does that sound familiar? It's just like the oil being poured out on Aaron's head. God has poured out, he's anointed us, he's poured out his spirit on us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. He chose us, he washed us, he clothed us, he anointed us, and this is all possible because in Christ our sins have been atoned for. Just like the priest needed a sacrifice, Christ is our sacrifice. He's our sin offering. Look at verse 13, Exodus 29, verse 13. It says this, And you shall take all the fat that covers the entrails and, and the long lobe of the liver and the two kidneys with the fat that is on them and burn them on the altar. Verse 14 says this, But the flesh of the bull and its skin and its done, you shall burn with fire outside the camp. It is a sin offering. Now listen to Hebrews thirteen eleven. For the body of those animals whose blood is bought, brought into the holy places by the high priest as a sacrifice for sins are burned outside the camp, verse 12, so Jesus also suffered outside the gate in order to sanctify the people through his own blood. Jesus is our sin offering. He was crucified outside the camp. He was crucified outside the gate. He was crucified outside of the holy city of Jerusalem so that we may be sanctified, set apart, holy to the Lord, like the priest. Not only that, but remember how the priest would put the blood of the fellowship offering on their ears, hands, and toes, showing that that they belong to God, holy to him for his service, their whole person. Well, listen to Hebrews 9, 13, for if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of heifer uh, sanctify uh, for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purifying our conscience from dead works, To serve the living God. Our whole person is to serve the living God. And not only that, remember how the ordination ended. In fellowship. In fellowship with God. The priests were invited to the table of God at the tent of meetings, at the tabernacle, for fellowship. Well, think about this. Because of the blood of Christ, we are invited to the Lord's table. The Lord's table in remembrance of him and fellowship with him and with one another. Listen, we have been chosen, we've been washed, we've been clothed, we've been anointed, we've been atoned for and set apart for a holy calling to serve the living God. And just like the priest, this is a privilege. It's a privilege. Listen to how Peter describes it. Just just listen to the excitement. We are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that, that you may proclaim the excellence of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. It's a privilege. It's a privilege. We are privileged. Through Christ, we have access to God. Boldly approaching the throne of grace. Through Christ, we have access to God and have been given a calling to glorify him, to proclaim his excellence, to to be the go-between between a holy, good, gracious God in a lost, sin-filled world. We are to proclaim his name to the world, to the nations, again. 
Remember the end of Exodus 29, verse 43. It says, there, there I will meet with the people of Israel, and, and it shall be sanctified by my glory. I will consecrate the tent of meeting and the altar. Aaron also and his sons I will consecrate to serve me as priests. I, I will dwell among the people of Israel and, and will be their God, and they shall know that I am Yahweh, their God, who brought them out of the land of Egypt, that I might dwell among them. I am Yahweh, their God. God saved Israel, then entered into a covenant with Israel, dwelt with Israel, and then put them in the middle of the world, in the middle of the nations, that his name would be known throughout all the earth. Well, what's our calling as God's priests in the New Testament? very similar. It's found in Matthew chapter 28. Craig just read it this morning. Verse 19. Therefore, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name. The name, one name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of of the age. We are to proclaim Jesus. We are to proclaim God to a lost world. We are his ambassadors. We are his go-between. We are a royal priesthood. We have been given a calling, a purpose to glorify God on this earth. Let me end this morning with a quote, a quote that I thought was just so perfect. It was by Philip Ryken. He he writes this. We have been called into his holy service. Many Christians think of the ministry as something that primarily or even exclusively is for ministers and missionaries. But that's not true. We are priests of the living God, and we have a holy obligation to serve him. We no longer serve him in the tabernacle, but in his holy sanctuary, the church, and also in the world. We serve him by praising his name. We serve him by giving graciously to the church. We serve him by binding up the wounds of the brokenhearted and embracing the outcast of society. We serve him by loving those who are hard to love with the same merciful love that we have received from God in Christ. We serve him by telling people to trust in Jesus and by doing whatever we do for his glory. We have a holy calling. Just like the priests, we have been set apart to serve the living God. And let me close by saying this, because I think this is important. One of the things I love about this church, and I've been here a long time, so I can brag on our church. One of the things I love about this church is that we get this. We get this. You guys don't wait for the professional ministers to to get there before you start ministering. I mean, I just see the body ministering to each other all the time. And then then we have these evangelists from our church that just go out and share the good news of Jesus nonstop to to co-workers, to people on the street, to, to family members. You get this. My job is to equip the saints for works of ministry. You're the saints that are to do the works of ministry. I just believe we get this. We are a church of ministers. We are a church of priests. You guys minister to one another and the world. Listen, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession that you may may proclaim the excellence of him. Let's pray. Dear God, our, our Father in heaven, Lord, we come again, Lord, humbly as we reflect on the grace that has been poured out on us, Lord that you would choose us, Lord, and you would bring us out of darkness into light, Lord, that that you wouldn't just choose us, Lord, but you also washed us, all all the imperfections, filth, the sins and iniquities in our life, Lord. 
But you wouldn't just leave us there, Lord, in our nakedness. You also clothed us with the righteousness of Christ and given us a holy calling, Lord. And you empowered us through your Spirit, pouring out the Holy Spirit on our lives, Lord. And this was all possible because of the atoning sacrifice of Jesus on the cross, Lord. I, I pray, Lord, right now, if there's someone in this room or, or listening online, Lord, that, that has never truly put their faith in your Son, trusted in Him, that they would understand that He came to live that perfect life, perfectly righteous. He died on the cross for us. He was raised on the third day. And that whoever would trust in Him for his righteousness, for what he has done, and not in their own works, Lord, will be saved. God, I pray that right now, if there's a person that has never done that, listening, that they would trust in your son, they would cry out to you for forgiveness, and they would put their faith in him. God, I pray for that in your son's name. Amen.